So as we transition from the Z test for single samples to the single samples T test, let's just do a quick reminder of when we'd use one versus the other. We use the Z test when we have a known sample mean. In other words, we have a mean from our sample and we know how many people were in our sample. And we have a population mean and we have a population standard deviation. And finally, that sample is over 30. That's when we'd use a Z test and that would be the appropriate test. If any of these are missing, then we need to see, do we have enough data to use the single samples T test? With the single samples T test, we need to know the samples mean, the samples in, just like the Z test, but we also need the sample standard deviation. Now this is not a difficulty because again, this is our sample. So all of this should be available. All we need, however, is the population mean. We no longer need the population standard deviation. So this is the big advantage, honestly, here, is that this is for when you can't find the population mean and standard deviation. All you have is the population mean. The final thing that isn't on here is that it does not have a minimum sample size. So the z-test always has the same criteria for accepting or rejecting the null hypothesis based on your test statistic, the calculated Z, and the value you need to exceed that alpha of 0.05. The t-test adds something that we're going to find in every single other statistical inferential test moving forward, and that is a probability distribution table that allows us to have a sliding scale of what do we need to satisfy and reject the null hypothesis. In other words, what do we need to say that our effect, our critical value that we calculate is different than the requirement or higher, bigger than the requirement for us to be able to claim an alpha of 0.05. But that's going to be dependent on how big our sample is. The larger the sample, the smaller the number. The smaller the sample, the larger the number. In other words, we need to find bigger and bigger effects for us to be able to make a claim that it wasn't doing the chance if we have a small sample. The larger and larger sample we have, the smaller and smaller the effect can be for us to claim their significance. So it isn't a set bar like with the z-test. It's on a sliding scale now. So let's look at the single samples t-test. The assumptions, we have to know the population mean, but that's it. We have to have the sample mean using interval or ratio data and the sample standard deviation. We also do need to know the n of the sample. We need to make sure that the sample that we've taken with interval or ratio data is normally distributed. And once again, that the samples observations, in other words, the samples performance was not directly influenced by the population. So independent observations. And again, the big advantage here is any sample size you can use. So the test is remarkably similar um, to the z-test. Once again, we have our actual mean of our group minus the population's mean. And once again, we're dividing it by a measure of variance, uh, standard deviations. What varies is where we're getting that standard deviation from. This time we're inferring it from our sample, not actually getting it from our population. Now let me just briefly talk about this as well, as long as we're on this slide. Almost every statistical technique, no matter how advanced we get, has some form of this equation. The top reflecting effect size, the bottom reflecting total variance. So let's just briefly talk about what we are doing here mathematically. The top of the equation is how much does our group differ from the population? Group mean minus population mean. So that's a measure of difference. That's a measure of effect. That's a measure of relationships. We're dividing it, however, by simply the standard deviation of either the population in the z-test or the standard deviation of our sample, in this case, adjusted for by the sample size or the n. What that is doing is basically just giving us a value of just variance in general. In other words, how much difference was due to actual difference, the top of the equation, effect size, compared to just the total variance in the sample? In other words, if you've got a pretty large difference, but then your sample had an enormous amount of variance, you're going to find that that large difference is still divided by a large number. So 1,000 divided by 1,000 is still 1. However, if you've got a fairly small difference, let's say 10, but there's not a whole lot of variance, 2, 
10 divided by 2 is 5. That's a very large number compared to 1. So with that small sample, you found a bigger effect. So generally, the larger the number is on the top of the equation, and the smaller the number is on the bottom of the equation, the more likely you are to find a meaningful relationship or difference. So effectively, the top is always effect or relationship, and the bottom is always total variance. And the question here is, in simple English, does your effect or relationship sing out, or does it, is it visible through the noise of all the other variance that's going on with those numbers? So in English, t-test obtained, the t-test for single sample is simply your sample mean minus your population mean. And then we're going to take the standard deviation of our sample divided by the square root of the size of our sample. So sample size, sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the number in our sample. Now, we have a new thing we have to worry about from this point on, because like I said, now that we have that obtained test statistic, we don't have one set number to compare it to to find out if we have a P of 0 0.05 or less. So now we need what's called degrees of freedom, DF. Degrees of freedom are the numbers of scores in a sample that are free to vary. This is kind of an obscure concept and a lot of students struggle with this a little bit. I think a better way to think about it is it's simply a characteristic of the sample statistic that determines the appropriateness of the sample distribution. What effectively mathematically degrees of freedom means is, let's take a look at that first sentence, the number of scores in a sample that are free to vary. What that basically means, if you had 10 people and you couldn't control, you could only control the score of one of those people. If you could control the score of one of those people, no matter what everyone else scored, you could always get the mean of that sample to be whatever you want. So if you had 10 people and they all said fives, so you've got five, 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 five across 10 people, nine people said five, 45, but you wanted the mean to be a 10, then you generally need to calculate what value do I need that last number to be to boost up the total number to where when it's divided by n, 10, it still comes out to a 10. So in that case, that means I need to get to 100. So I've got 45, I make the last score a 55. So everyone scored a five, the one I controlled scored a 55, adds up to 100 divided by 10 is 10. So again, what this really gets at, it's, it's theoretical. We're never actually taking control of people. We're never actually putting scores in, but it basically just represents how many scores would I need to control to be able to adjust it to whatever I wanted if I wanted to. Like I said, that's kind of an esoteric mathematical concept. I think the second sentence is a better one. Just recognize that for every, every test statistic, there is gonna be a degrees of freedom. It's broadly brought out, for, it's, it's calculated by this concept of scores that are free to vary. But what it actually does is it's creating us, it's basically just telling us where on the probability chart we have to look. And the higher the N, generally the high, well not generally, always the higher the degrees of freedom. So what we use that degrees of freedom chart for is a distribution of critical values. In this case, this is specifically the, the distribution of critical values for a CT test for independent samples. So what we're now going to use is the degrees of freedom. So if an exact degrees of freedom is not on the table, always shift to the num next larger number. So the smaller DF, smaller. And what I mean by larger number is the larger number you need to actually have uh, p-value. So again, the top of the scale and a lot of these critical value tables may only have one or two columns because they recognize that most of the time we're not going to use the rest of this data because in the social sciences, we want that p of 0 0.05. So we find the column for p of 0 0.05 and then we calculate, find the degrees of freedom for our particular test. In this case, Let's assume that we had 16 participants, so 16 minus 1 is 15, our degrees of freedom is 15. So we find our degrees of freedom, we find our alpha of 0 0.05, and we cross-reference. That is the value that we need to find on our obtained test statistics. So when we run the t-test for, for single samples, the value we need is needs to be plus or minus, depending on if we have a one-tailed or two-tailed test, or directional or non-directional test, 
Now take a look at this table. Let's take a look again at 0 0.05, but this time let's go down to a degrees of freedom of four. We only had five participants. So if you look at the four column of degrees of freedom, I'm sorry, four row, bring that row over, you now need a 2.13. You need a larger effect for you to be able to claim that it occurred due to chance. Let's go on up to a degrees of freedom of 80. So we had 81 participants. Now, if we look at the chart, we need a 1.66. So we need a smaller number to claim statistical significance. Now, if you get one of these larger tables, you can also use this information to actually get a better estimate of exactly how probable or not probable you're wrong. So again, if we had degrees of freedom of 15 and I actually calculated a 3.5, if we go over, we can go all the way over, and we're again, we're on the row with a 15. We can go over and find that basically a 3.5 meets the bar for a p-value of 0 0.0025. I didn't quite get to 0 0.001, but I could now effectively report a p of 0 0.003. Um, so again, this allows us to be a little bit more clear in our effect size. But what we're doing again is we're still obtaining a test statistic. We're running the t-test, which is almost identical to the z-test. It just changes where we're getting that standard deviation from. But instead of a set value, I am now going to have a sliding scale. And notice degrees of freedom goes down to one. So I could have two participants and still run this test. So if we run it in SPSS, and that's one of the other neat things about it, is that the t-test for single samples is actually available as a single sample test in SPSS. It's going to calculate all this for us. And this is going to be the first time also, the first statistical test, where we can actually look at what the SPSS outcome looks like. In other words, the output. What does it look like? So the first thing we see is that first box. It tells us our N, 16, so we had 16 participants in the study. It tells us the mean of that single continuous or ratio data that we measured is 1.8, and it also tells us our standard deviation, 0 0.80083. The second box actually gives us our test statistic. Now, in this case, notice it says test value, 2.5 at the top of the box. That tells us what was the mean of the population, the mu, that we inputted for this test. Then we simply go down to the actual variable we measured, study time. We get our t, that's our obtained test statistic, in this case, negative 3.496. We get our degrees of freedom, 15. We get our significance, 0 0.003. And also it'll tell us the mean difference. In other words, our group was seven points lower than our actual population. How we would report this is the sample mean, mean 1.8, standard deviation 0 0.80, and that's gotten from that first box at the top, was significantly lower than the population mean, 2.50, and that's from the top of the second box. And then we're going to actually report the test statistic. We're going to report what test we ran, in this case, T. Now, here's a quick note. Anytime you're reporting a test statistic, it is going to have a notation. It's going to be a T, it's going to be an R, it's going to be an F. Whatever that number, that letter is, that letter tells people approximately what test you ran. And it should always be reported in italics. It should then be immediately followed by a parentheses, which reports the degrees of freedom. The only time you wouldn't do this is a Z test for single samples. You just put a capital Z italicized. You then are going to tell people what was your actual obtained test statistic what was actually calculated. In this case, negative 3.50. And finally, you're going to report the P, 0 0.003. Now, I do want to make a note that generally speaking, what I suggest as far as decimals is always report to two decimal places. The only time you would ever report beyond two decimal points is P value. Report the actual P value down to 0 0.001. If it's less than 0 0.001, you would simply report less than 0 0.001. We never report a P of zero because a P of zero says there is no chance you're wrong. And there's always a chance, no matter how strong the effect is, that some trick of nature and randomness resulted in what we found. So again, there's where we get our ends, there's where we get our mean and our standard deviation. So now we have the t, -test for Z the t test and Z test for single samples in our toolbox. And again, this is when we have a single continuous or ratio data from one sample and nothing else but a known value to compare it to. Also, with the t test for single samples, we were introduced to the idea of degrees of freedom.
and using the degrees of freedom to find that sliding scale of what is the test statistic that I need for me to reject the null hypothesis. In other words, my P, my probability, is below is 0 0.05 or below. Now we're going to move on to what happens when we have two variables, one of them a categorical IV and one of them a continuous or ratio DV, and specifically those two variables, we now have to look at how many categorical IVs are there, there are, or, I'm sorry, how many levels are there to the categorical IV. If there are only two, so I have a study where I have an IV that's categorical, I have an outcome that's continuous or ratio, and there is only two levels to my IV, that takes us to the question of are the differences between these two groups between or within? Between means two different groups that did not interact. Within means the same group of people exposed to two different conditions. If the answer is between two groups that did not interact, that takes us to our first truly inferential statistic that is not requiring us to get an obtained value from somewhere else. That is the t-test for independent measures, and that's what we're going to discuss next. So we're starting to fill our toolbox. Already in our toolbox is the z-test for single samples and the t-test for single samples. We're now looking at the independent measures um, uh, t-test, often called the t-test for uh, between samples or the independent measures t-test. We have an IV that's categorical two levels, and we have a single DV that's continuous. So we're going to put that in our toolbox. So let's first talk about the t-test itself. So now we're starting to move into the kind of birth of statistics, and the t-test was one of the very first inferential tests. It was originally referred to as simply the t-test or student's t-test, and this was the original version that we're looking at. It was an independent measures test. In fact, there wasn't a between version yet, and it was often referred to as the student's t-test. The reason for this was that it was actually created under property from Guinness Beer. So Guinness had someone working for them that created this technique, and they were wanting to create a technique to basically mathematically determine was there a significant difference in the taste ratings of various versions of their beer as they were distilling, or not distilling, but brewing beer. The person who designed this test was a statistician, was a mathematical a person, but they were working for Guinness, and they were working under a condition that anything they produced was the property of Guinness. The person asked for permission to publish this in scientific journals. They got permission, but they weren't allowed to put their name on it. Guinness agreed not to put the Guinness name on it, which I guess we should be thankful for, that we're not constantly doing the Guinness test for t-tests, but they allowed it to simply be called students. The person who designed this test is W.S. Gossett. Worked for Guinness, Guinness Brewing Company in Ireland. He designed the test to compare quality in beers. He was one of the many founders of the Biometrica Journal, and he was also friends with both Pearson and Fisher, who we're going to learn about in the future. Now, as we learn a little bit about the people that design these statistical tests, I will be very blunt and honest that they do not necessarily compare well when we look at them with a modern eye. Many of them had very uh, traditional viewpoints of differences between various countries and nationalities that were very common at the time. Um, also, most of them didn't like each other. They were all competitors trying to basically get their statistical techniques more and more presence and more and more kind of use. So I'm going to just spend a second or two no longer than I normally would on W.S. Gossett simply because he wasn't a eugenicist. He really didn't care about differences in people. He really wasn't trying to make statistical techniques necessarily to kind of, well, honestly, support of various political or cultural opinions. He simply wanted to create math for math's sake, and he liked a good beer. And it shows in the fact that he was fairly close friends with most of the other big names in creating statistics at this time, all old English guys, who at the time really didn't like each other. Okay, so let's look at the independent measures t-test. Let's look at the assumptions. This time, that independent of observations becomes a little bit more important. Um, we've already talked about it as a requirement of those other tests, but now we actually have to be a little methodologically careful that we are not allowing our two groups. Because remember, one of the assumptions of the t-test is that we have a categorical IV with two levels. That basically means 
two different groups of people we're comparing. Those two groups should not, in, within the design of our study, have the ability to um, basically influence each other's performance. The populations, and in this case, these are our sample populations, the two groups must be normally distributed. There must be normality, skewness and kurtosis. Now we're going to look at the outcome. How we're looking at normality is we're looking at that outcome, that continuous or ratio data, and we're measuring to find out is there skewness or kurtosis. But we also then, once we find that, we need to do one additional test. We need to make sure that when we split those two groups, those two populations, those two samples, that their variance is relatively equal to each other. We need to check for homogeneity of the variance, not just that it's normally distributed, but that it also not only stays normally distributed when we split it up into our two groups, but also that those variances look somewhat similar. The way we test for this is Levine's test. This is one of the few tests that we don't want significant. So when we calculate a Levine's test for a quality of variance, we're gonna get an F value. We're not necessarily gonna report this. All we're really looking for is that significance. We want that significance to be above 0.05. We want it to be insignificant. That means there is a insignificant difference in the view of the, basically the nature of the variance, the nature of the distributions between our two samples. So what we're looking for and what we don't want is one, you know, when we look at the group together, we've got a DV and outcome, let's say it's test scores. We check for skewness and kurtosis across all 100 participants and find it's normally distributed. Excellent, no violations of assumptions. But now what homogeneity says is, well, you've got 100 people that took a test score, but you actually divided them. 50 people got a, t a study guide, 50 of them didn't, and you're comparing these two groups. When we split those groups, do we find at least relatively normal distributions in both groups? And if we don't, we may have violated homogeneity of variance. And what that might look like is one group might be leptokurtic and one group might be platykurtic. When you put them together, you get a normal distribution. So that's what Levine's test is gonna test for. It's gonna look for that difference as well. And again, just drum this into your head. Levine's test, we want it insignificant. So with a between participant design or an independent group, and you're gonna see these two terms used kind of interchangeably in statistics, between participant or independent groups means the same thing. Different people in different groups. Groups are not matched, they're not correlated, and they're not the same of people, they're not the same people in each group. So in this case, what we're looking at again, as I already kind of talked about, the top is going to be the mean of the first group minus the mean of the second group. Now notice that this could be a positive or a negative number, completely dependent on who you decide is group one versus group two. If group one had a 70 and group two had a 50, and you decide group one is the one with the 70 and group two is the one with the 50, you'd have a positive 20 at this, at this part of the equation. However, if you decided group one was the low group and group two was the high group, 50 minus 70, you now have a negative 20. So recognize that the sign of T when doing a T test has nothing more than to do with which group you put in first. I would suggest that you always label your groups in the direction of your hypothesis. So you basically always want to make sure that the group that you think is going to be higher is group two. This will give you a positive T. It's just easier to interpret and some people who don't know start to think of this the same way as you think of as a correlation where negative means a negative relationship, positive means a positive relationship. And it somewhat does, it's simply, but what it means is nothing about the relationship, it's just how you labeled the groups. And again, the bottom of this equation is simply total variance within and between. So all the variance across both of the groups. So the numerator is simply the mean of your first group minus the mean of your second group. And like I said, positive or negative is simply the order that you put them in. Our degrees of freedom in this case is N minus one for our first group and N minus one for our second group. So again, if I wanted to control the results, I would need to only control one person in each group to do so. I could create any outcome then by artificially creating one value or artificially changing one value. Now, again, I wanna stress, we're never doing that, but that's what degrees of freedom represents. So basically the t-test for independent groups or the t-test for between participant design, the degrees of freedom is N minus two because we have two groups. So again, SPSS is gonna run this for us. It's gonna give us the values and what we need to know.
And the top of the group is, again, going to be descriptive statistics. Where it's going to show us group 1 and group 2. In this case, group 1 had an 87 mean, and group 2 had a 67.5 mean. We have our standard deviations. We're now going to get the actual t-test. The first thing it's going to report, especially if we tell it to, is Levine's test. And again, we're going to see in this case the significance for Levine's test is 0.791. So that 0.791 represents the fact that it's not significant, and that's what we wanted to see. The next thing, notice, is that we have two lines. Now let's look at the far left. Equal variance assumed, equal variance not assumed. So what happens if Levine's test is significant? So we calculated the descriptive statistics, found out our outcome was normally distributed. It wasn't skewed. It wasn't kurtotic. But we find we violated the assumption. The significance of the Levine's test is below 0.05. We simply then would report there was a violation of the homogeneity of variance, Levine's test equal, report the significance, p-value, and then say due to this, we use the equal variance not assumed version of the t-test. In other words, if Levine's test is violated, all it means is you don't report the top line, you report the bottom line, and the bottom line is adjusted for the violation. Now, the larger the violation is, the larger the adjustment is. Now, notice in this case, the significance, 0.791, pretty much Levine's test said, these guys are very similar distributed. There's not a major problem here. In fact, the chance of this occurring due to the difference we found uh, occurring to chance is almost 80%, which also means the adjustment is going to be very minor. However, if it was significant, 0.05 or lower, we'd see a much larger difference in that bottom line. So, in this case, we're going to take the top line. We get our T, 0.593. We got our degrees of freedom, 18. Now, remember, degrees of freedom is N minus 2. That tells us we had 20 people in our group. We have our significance. Now, SPSS reports 0 0.000 because it rounds to, to three decimal points in this case. Remember, though, you're going to report this as less than 0 0.001. So again, we've got our N of each group, 10 and 10. We've got our means, we've got our standard deviations. So there's our descriptive statistics that we can report if we found a significant difference. We've got our Levine's test, which tells us it's okay to use the top line. Using the top line, we've got our T, we've got our degrees of freedom, and we've got our significance. So we have a significant difference. Group one with a score of 87 definitely scored higher statistically significantly than group two with a 67.5. And again, if Levine's test had been significant, we would report the bottom line. We'd report a mean, a T of 5.932, the same. We'd actually report a degrees of freedom of 17.96. And that would let people know that we had made an adjustment to degrees of freedom. We basically lowered it. We made it a little harder for us to claim statistical significance because of the violation. And again, we'd report P. So again, dealing with normalcy, violations of normalcy, if we have unequal variance, we can adjust the degrees of freedom downward. It degrees, decreases the chance of rejecting the null hypothesis and it reduces the bias in the pooled variance due to homogeneity of variance. And again, what looks, what basically homogeneity of variance looks like is something like we're seeing there on the right. If we've got homogeneity of variance and we find a mean difference, what it tells us is there was a legitimate difference between the two groups and the two groups are normally distributed. So basically the only story that really is interesting is the mean difference. But if we've got a violation of Levine's test, that tells us that not only was there a mean difference, if significant, and again, this is the t-test being significant, there also is more going on. The two groups were very different. So in this case, not only would the, the blue line representing the study guide group, not only did the study guide group do 20 points better, they also tended to cluster around their midpoint much higher. In other words, you had almost an equal chance of getting the top grade in both groups, but you had a much less chance of getting anything lower than about a C in the study guide group. It, it narrowed the distribution, which means if all I was reporting in this case were mean differences, I'm missing part of the story of what seemed to have happened. So if we have the independent group's t-test and we know there's a difference, what's the next step? If you remember from the start of these lectures, the next step is calculating the effect size. And here's something that SPSS, for some reason, just doesn't like to do. It doesn't like to give us a Cohen's D for independent groups t-test or between subjects t-test. We have to calculate it. 
And it's Cohen's D, and here's Cohen's D, the effect size. So this is something you're going to have to hand calculate. You're going to take the mean of the first group minus the mean of the second group. That's your effect size. That's the top of the equation. The bottom of the equation is the standard deviation of the first group squared divided by 2 added to the standard deviation squared of the second group divided by 2. And once you calculate both of those and add them together, you take the square root. That's the bottom. So then you divide the top by the bottom. All of those numbers that you need are coming right from the group statistics. So the means and the standard deviations, you're just plugging them into the equation and doing the math. So the top becomes 87.0 minus 67.5. The bottom becomes 7.53 squared by 7.17 squared. Both of them divided by 2. Both of them added together. And then you take the square root. So doing that on the top of the equation, 87 minus 67.5 gives us 19.5. Doing that at the bottom gives us a 7.35. And that equates to a Cohen's D of 2.65. That is our effect size. So we would add that to our statistical line. T, degrees of freedom, the value of T, the P value, and then Cohen's D. The reason we're reporting Cohen's D is we have a significant effect. Remember, we never report an effect size if it's not a significant difference or relationship. Every effect size kind of has a rule of thumb, and these rule of thumbs are not always set in stone. You may find different values. Generally, the guide for Cohen's D is a D of 0.2 is small. In other words, what a Cohen's D of 0.2 is, is yeah, it's significant, but it's a significance that may not be worth really looking at. So remember, the larger the sample size, the more likely we are to find a significant difference, even with small differences. So if this was test performance, for example, we might find that there is, if we had a sample of 1,000, we might find that a difference of five points, so one group scored an 82 and one group scored an 87, is significant. But the Cohen's D might be a 0.2 or 0.3. That's telling us that they both still all got Bs, basically. There wasn't a huge difference, even though it was significant. A Cohen's D of 0.5 or higher is moderate, and anything over a 0.8 is large. So in this case, 2.65, we have a very large Cohen's D. Not only did we find a difference in test effects, it was a big difference, basically 20 plus, almost 20 point difference. So the people in the study guide group got high Bs, the people in the non-study guide group got Ds. That's a pretty meaningful difference. And especially if that intervention didn't take much time or money, it's definitely an intervention worth doing. So the summary of the results, once we actually have calculated all this, we need to write it up in APA style. And this is where I want to remind you that you do need to be careful on your homework so that even though this is fairly formulaic, there's a fair amount of variance in here still on how you write this up. And you should not be cut and pasting my samples, and you should not be cut and pasting other students' samples. You are still, even on these little snippets, responsible as graduate students to not be plagiarizing anyone else's work. So here's an example though. The first thing that we want to do is simply tell people what we did. An independent samples t-test was conducted to examine study time, our IV, on exam performance, our DV. Type of study has a significant, significant large effect on exam performance. So we state what we found and then we support it with statistics. T, italicized, 18 in parentheses, our degrees of freedom, the actual obtained test statistic, what we calculated T to be, 5.93, the probability we're wrong, P less than 0 0.001, and because it's significant, Cohen's D, 2.65. Notice that when we're reporting an effect size, we're not going to italicize any descriptors, but we are going to italicize again the letter that represents the effect size. And then we're going to put it into English. On average, students who study during two three-hour study sessions perform better on a test, mean of 8.0 or 87.0%, standard deviation 7.53, than students who study during a one six-hour session, mean 67.5%, standard deviation 7.17. And then we might also throw in a visual, a table, or a graph to help make the point. So let's divide that out a bit. Let's take a look at what we're actually doing here. So the first thing we're doing is we're telling people what test 
was and what your variables were. This is also where you'd put if there was a violation of the Levine's test, if you had to remove an outlier because of a violation of skewness, this is where you report that as well. Also, if you had to do a mathematical adjustment to get around a problem with kurtosis or skewness, this is where you'd report it. Next, we're actually going to report what was found, whether it was significant or not. So a taste test statement. Was it significant? Was it not significant? And then the stats that back it up. We're then, if significant, going to report the effect size. And finally, if it's significant, we're going to describe the nature of the effect.